Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the CPA podcast, a place where we chat about our own recent achievements in the area of electronics, software, and mechanical engineering, and more likely than not, give excuses for not having done anything at all. Hello and welcome back to another episode. It's been a very long time since the last episode aired, I think five weeks, and I sincerely apologize for that. Um, I've been doing other stuff, I haven't really been in a mood for technical stuff mostly, and also uh, the time I would normally spend on electronic stuff I've been sporting, basically. It's probably a phase, it'll get back to techy stuff in a while, but uh, for now it is what it is. This episode, Domen was so nice as to, uh, to lend us a hand, so let's listen to that first. Oh, and uh, we're terrible sorry about the sound quality, but uh, it's not a problem, it's actually a competition. So if you know where Domen is located, judging by the sound of the planes flying overhead that you hear every once in a while, or you know which TV program is playing in the background, let us know and maybe you win a prize. Did you do anything? Uh, anything electronics-wise? Let's start with anything at all, and then maybe refine it to electronics if we did a lot of stuff. <laughs> no, just for electronics, I just have some old stuff. You remember mm-hmm. we talked a bit about data collection, yeah, and sensors around mm-hmm. around the flat. Yeah. So, so I put some sensors around the flat, like temperature sensor in living room and bedroom, and one infrared sensor for the hallway. And, well, he wants the data to be shown in a nice way and ideally not to do the work yourself. Yeah. Uh, so there are some nice free services, free for hobbies, I guess. Uh, right. They limit you usually up to 10 sensors, which is fine for me. I only have three now. Um, and it's... It, the three I tried were Adafruit, Push Data, and ThinkSpeak, and they're all really easy to use. You can just, it's just a, a post request, HTTP post request. Mm-hmm. So in Shell, you can use curl and send data to them, include your API key, and that's it. Then it shows up on some website. And yeah, for the push data has a really interesting thing where you don't even need to register to use it. As a part of URL, you include your email and then it just automatically creates yeah. your account, sends you the confirmation email to that email and data is already live. Oh, you, let, you, you told me, I think, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's very convenient, I guess. And what about, and if someone else uses the same email address as you, do, does he like pollute your data set or something like that? Uh, yeah, they could. <laughs> so, really weird. So, so yeah, that's the, the, how do you say, the convenient bit is just to use your email and mm-hmm. just do it this way. But then when you get that confirmation email, you can log in and you can have that secure API key. So it's only you that puts the data in your data set. Oh, right. Yeah, if it's just demo or just some proof of concept at yeah. home, you, you don't really want to bother with all that. You just make it quick and make it work. Okay, it's pretty nice. And um, FK, I think you showed me some stuff before. Was that? Uh, I think yeah, you showed me good. graphs of, of measurement data. Yeah, I showed you some, uh, some links, some graphs of temperatures. Okay. The weird heating in this flat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you can you do uh, um, like a mini PLC or something like that to so say if temperature is higher than so and so for so and so many seconds do this? I mean, I, I guess you can do it on the client, of course. You can. How yeah. do you get data out of it In, using web interface, or do you also have uh, like a JSON uh, interface or something like that to pull data points? Or how do you want to use um, it? That's what I mean. You, you can transfer them from the websites. I think from all th- all three of them. And on, I think I saw on Adafruit and also on ThinkSpeak, you can create some sort of rules, like if it reaches some boundary, you do something, or something like that, something a bit smarter than just hmm. displaying it. All right. Do you also do you just want to use sensors for your uh, 
for your flat also like actuators so to control stuff or only measure stuff oh it was just sensors just that's, sensors that's a good point if i want to control something I, i'm not sure if i could use these yeah it, it would be weird i guess you want to do all that stuff on the on the client side not on the, the internet has nothing to do with that i guess I, I mean for controlling stuff i've used some other uh, tools before home assistant and similar that's you kind of need a, a Raspberry Pi or PC mm -hmm. that's running that, mm. and then that presents you a web interface, and you can click to to control some relays or whatever. Yeah, okay. But, but mm. that's a bit more configuration. It's a bit more work to set up. Okay. So what does that do? You basically turn your Raspberry Pi or your PC into a small PLC with a user interface, something like that. You can um, input signals and you can you can uh, say if the temperature is high, I don't know what, if the temperature is higher and the light is on, then, then activate motor, activate gun, or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I guess you, you, mm. can, you can make it like that. Mm. But you can also... Just manually. Usually you have like a Raspberry Pi or something, and then you could connect different things to, through Wi-Fi or whatever, and then... That Raspberry Pi is the, like the main controller yeah. that runs the web UI. Okay. And then it just forwards signals between that home assistant and some smaller, less powerful sensors. Okay. Right. Relays. Okay. And, and yeah, I, I never really did anything. Is it all standardized? So if I get the, I don't know how it is now. If you get a like a like a temperature sensor, I don't even know how to connect it. Is it SPI or wireless or Bluetooth or? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and no idea. Or Wi-Fi? I, think, I don't know. I think the sensors are, are still what they used to be, just uh, Digital. SPI or uh. I squared C or one wire. Okay, and on it's just yeah. Normally, you you can also buy the Wi-Fi something. Mm -hmm. I guess just a Wi-Fi proxy for that right. old stuff that that you already know. Yeah. Okay. One was I I squared C sensor just wired directly to Raspberry Pi. And yeah, that was uh, just uh, a, a shell script and built-in tools into that hmm. Raspberry Pi distribution, and that worked nicely. Okay. Uh, for something else, there was a, a Wi-Fi connected uh, one of those Sonoff basic. Mm -hmm. Not sure if you know those very cheap Chinese modules. Yeah, you told. I think you showed me. At yeah, least the name sounds very familiar. And that was just it connects. It's connected to Wi-Fi, and then it sends MQTT um, messages to Raspberry Pi, mm. oh. which then parses them and then forwards to Adafruit or whatever. Yeah. Okay. I never did too much with it. So, uh, um, and actually, okay. Now, if you have such a thing, so basically, the, what 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 they offer is uh, like a. Uh, application software or something like that you can put in your Raspberry Pi and then you get a user interface I guess you can manually control things or read uh, stuff and do diagnostic stuff uh, I'm not sure what you yeah. have to do yourself and whatnot but that's what I mean so if you have a SPI, if you have a new SPI device you still have to make your own uh, like shell glue code or something like that to make it work with uh, with uh, with what they offer or yeah for, for that uh, I square C sensor I I created you could say in a way a driver but yeah. it's it's not much of a driver. It's just send this I squared C command, get this data back, and then calculate trans transform those hex bytes into integer with temperature mm -hmm. data. Okay, and what do you do with the integer then? Last question. Uh, just use curl to send it. Oh to right! Oh right! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So it's just a very silly shell script. A few lines. Yeah. All right. At least if it breaks, it's easy to fix. <laughs> yeah. So do, do, does everything happen on the server then? Uh, it isn't maybe too, going too far, but uh, I never play with it, so everything looks new. So maybe um, so. Let's say if you have a actuator and a sensor, and your sensor, what you just you have a SP, yeah, I could I squared C sensor, what you just had, and you made a little shell script that reads the data and sends it to a web server, Adafruit web server. Let's say that, mm -hmm. and. Um, and if you also have a relay to turn on the light and uh, turn on and off the light. Oh, yeah, but I'm not sure with these 
these websites that are listed if you can do that all right that's that that other system like home assistant which is like a bulkier system that's running on raspberry pi mm-hmm. that, that needs quite i mean needs quite a bit of configuration to set it up the way you want it to work okay it's like like a, a bit more serious maybe i mean more professional yeah definitely yeah kind of hmm. <laughs> thank you very much do you have any other uh stuff you want to talk about or uh there was when was that i think two weeks ago uh, we went uh, with Nico. We went to a sewing show, mm-hmm. with the stitching fabrics together, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I kind of I expected at least a bit of electronics, you know, be, because it was a lot of DIY. Yeah. So I guess it could be high tech, mm-hmm. and the sewing machines were at least the embroidery ones making the really elaborate patterns they were high tech it's mm. just I, I expected maybe leds only saw two of them in a in a frame at some exhibition part there was like some very old car and four lights uh, <laughs> all right LEDs. yeah that makes sense <laughs> so at least there was okay. that it was nice yeah. <laughs> so, so what are you saying all these people who are uh, into sewing or at least what you saw are not not using electronic, but more the um, like complexity in mechanical stuff and so on. No, I'm thinking maybe there's they're missing a part of it. Yeah, maybe some companies. Oh, or right. If someone who wants to get through, get rich quick yeah. could start doing something like that, selling that events that like could that. Could be you. Nah. Lazy. Yeah, you want to be rich quick, so this is your uh, the opportunity. Oh yeah, that, that's me. That, that, that is a good plan. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, okay, okay. If you're interested, you can tell a little bit about what I did here, uh, which is not a yeah, whole yeah. lot or yeah, a whole lot of small small things. What I did was um, you know the WS two eight one two lads. I think everyone knows him. So it is the, the <laughs> like the the the. the, the LED and the die and oh the LED and the controller in one package and, and you can send data in it and mm-hmm. so on right so yeah. we had these uh, small uh, disco projector from a local uh, budget store it was not too cheap but it was a nice box with a nice lens nice nice big uh, yeah <laughs> it was a nice yeah. box <laughs> yeah well there, there was all kinds of stuff in there so a mirror and uh, and a small LED PCB so you can turn it on and then the mirror rotated and was um. Uh, not a uniform mirror, but all kinds of little mirrors glued onto a, into a dish, so it uh, would project mm-hmm. all kinds of like uh, asset things on the wall, basically. <laughs> and uh, so, okay. yeah, that, that was pretty nice. So, but I wanted to for the box and the lens because I think I saw a, a YouTube video of someone who also mm-hmm. uses the a box and the lens. I think it was an old style disco effect for actual discos. They used it use that kind of stuff to project stuff instead of lasers now they do do it with lasers i guess but uh, the thing is you can you can put a led so so what the thing was when you remove all the innards all the electronics was a box basically mm-hmm. and a lens and that's it and if you put stuff uh, at the back of the box like a led it would shine through the lens yeah. and then onto a wall and the thing is it doesn't uh, it doesn't spread out very much so after after a few meters or two meters you still have a dot mm-hmm. uh, like a five centimeter dot or something like that right oh. so it's pretty sharp and uh, the thing is because it's, it's pretty small it's pretty bright so you don't need a whole lot of uh, you don't need a super sharp led to create a, a sharp image on the wall because it, that lens mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, projects it almost parallel so that was, yeah. a, was a nice thing so we glued a like a matrix of these leds at the back of the box and then uh, just proof of concept software and then can project an uh, 11 I think in my case 10 or 11 by 6 uh, LED matrix on the wall is RGB LED so you can do a lot of nice stuff with that if you have nice software so it's a completely solid state I'm gonna okay. put that somewhere just for uh, entertainment purposes so that's basically what I did <laughs> it's uh, not a whole lot not not super fancy but it was nice a uh, nice hack hey we got to some Photos or videos yeah, yeah. of that. Yeah, I put it on the Twitter even, but I can put it in the show notes as well. Uh, videos, no, because I, I wanted yeah. to make it. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is not 
super rocket science stuff. It's, it's nice, a nice project. But I think with these things, it's the software that counts. So I, yeah, uh, but the, I think you agree. If you if you look at um, sometimes they demonstrate LED matrices or something like that at a fair or a event, and the hardware is pretty cool. So you have a big matrix, but the software sucks a little bit. So it's, it's basically very simple pattern repeating. So how about if you invest more time into making software? <laughs> it can be super, super nice. Yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah, why not? Yeah, it costs, costs time. <laughs> but at least that, that's what I want to do a little bit. Make well, a little bit more nicer software and then put it somewhere at the local hacker space or something like that to display crap on the wall. Um, yeah, I mean, everything takes some time. Mm. Uh, if you're... Uh, if you've already invested so and so much time, invest a bit more. Yeah, exactly. It. Right. So far as, yeah, that's uh, that's that's exactly it. If you have a hardware already, why not invest a little bit of time in the software to make it really super nice? And then here's something I forgot when talking about the WS two eight one two LEDs. I read that there's also a WS2813 LED, which is backwards compatible with the previous one. And it has, instead of one data input, it has two data inputs. Now the WS2812 has a combined clock and data pin. So it has one input and it does data reshaping in the ship itself and then sends it out, basically. Uh, the 2813 has two data inputs. So how it works is, one data input um, reads the data going into the previous LED in the chain. So each LED is robust against a single failure of the previous LED. So it intelligently intelligently compares two data inputs and then makes a choice depending on where whether it receives uh, data from the previous LED in the chain. Something like that. So a little bit of redundancy. So um, it doesn't really cost anything on your PCB, just a little bit of track. So it's probably a nice idea. To be honest, I haven't played around with these LEDs enough to even see one failure, but I guess if you have huge projects, you might want to be interested in that solution. Apart from toying with uh, LEDs, uh, the only thing I did was put some VGA generator, or one VGA generator board at the Hackalot uh, hackerspace in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and with four monitors. It looks pretty nice on top of a cupboard, and uh, so to make the place a little bit brighter. So maybe I put another set there, depending on whether I can get my hands on four extra monitors, but uh, they should come cheap, as in free. And finally, two upcoming events. Actually, it's not upcoming, it's ongoing. The first one is the Retro Challenge of March 2019. and. When this airs, it is March, and it is the end of March. And uh, to be honest, I also have my project going, but I didn't do anything for it. So uh, I think there's going to be a spectacular failure again. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure what to do with that. I'm a little bit pressed for time, but we'll see if I can maybe put in a few days of work or something like that. So uh, good luck, fellow contestants. And uh, another semi-local thing is a Maker Fair in Dortmund, in Germany. Maker Fair Ruhr, I think it is. In the Daza building, I think it's... Uh, I talked about it last time, I think it was a year ago already. It was a very nice building. It's a work museum, something like that. Work exhibition, all kinds of work-related stuff. So it's a super, super nice environment. So I urge you to go there. It's the 23rd and 24th March. Uh, so basically you have one day to go there. So, uh, so do it. So that was all for now. For more information, links and previous episodes, visit podcast.cba.si. Stay tuned, thanks for listening and goodbye.